Hi everyone, this is Veda from Zephyr Lake Carmelite Mission. In today's video, I will review lesson nine for phase one of Lake Carmelite formation. Uh, in this lesson, we will see Elijah and Mary as models of Carmelite spirituality. And in the second part, we will review the Carmelite brown scapular devotion. As most of you already know, many of the Catholic religious orders are named after their founders. As an example, the Franciscans are named after St. Francis of Assisi, the Dominicans are named after St. Dominic, and so on. However, the Carmelite order is named after a place, you know, Mount Carmel in Holy Land. The Carmelites don't have a very clear and precise idea of who and how and when our order was actually founded. However, we have strong tradition, tradition and we believe that our order is a continuation of the hermits who lived on Mount Carmel after the example of Prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. That's why we have a great affinity to Holy Land and to Prophet Elijah. It was on Mount Carmel that Prophet Elijah defeats the prophets of the false gods. So the story goes that Elijah was the only surviving prophet of the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because all the rest were killed by the evil king of that time and his queen. And Elijah is fleeing from this, uh, his persecutors, they want to kill him too. And then he arrives at Mount Carmel where he is challenged by the false prophets and the prophets of the false gods. And Elijah proves that God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is the one and only true God because God sends fire to accept the sacrifice that Elijah offers but nothing happens when the prophets of the false gods, you know, pray to their gods. Nothing happens to their sacrifice. It stays just the way it is. So you can read more about this in the first book of Kings in the Old Testament. And we know that um, based on that story, Elijah is very zealous for God and he's faithful to God. And he wins the contest against the prophets of Baal. And after his victory, he slaughters the 400 false prophets of Baal. And that's why Elijah is often depicted with a fiery sword. It shows that he has prophetic power and zeal for God. But here, you know, I'd like to say that God does not want us to kill each other. In fact, even in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, God very clearly says, do not kill. And we also know that Jesus forgave his executioners from the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was very clear to his disciples in saying that we need to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So we must not take the slaughtering of the 400 prophets of Baal by Prophet Elijah literally as an example. And in fact, during the Crusades, that's kind of what happened, that people were literally killing each other in the name of God, both Christians and Muslims. Well, we know that's not what God wants of us, his children. In fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We need to be examples of God's love through our lives of prayer and action and faithfulness to God. That way, through our example, people will be to, able to see us as a witness to Christ, who is the uncreated word of God who entered time to reveal the merciful face of the Father to mankind and to also pay the price of our redemption by his death on the cross and by his resurrection, we gain eternal life. And our lives and the way we love our neighbor and our faithfulness to God 
needs to attract people to Christ and not scare them away by violence, war, and prejudice. And that's what faithfulness and being zealous for God really means for Christians. Now, coming back to the history of Kamal in the late 13th century, when, we knew, when new members joined the Carmelite order, they were told that they were becoming part of a group that existed from the time of Prophet Elijah and he, who was followed by his disciple, Prophet Elisha. Uh, we again see in the Old Testament book of Kings that there was a succession or a continuation of Prophet Elijah's mission when Elijah is taken up body and soul to heaven in a chariot of fire his cloak falls on his disciple, Prophet Eli Elisha, who then receives the double spirit of his master, Elijah, and he continues the mission of Elijah. We also read that Elijah had many followers, and so tradition says that uh, hermits of Elijah continue to live on Mount Carmel, and they, there were still hermits on Mount Carmel, um, you know, thousands of years later when Jesus uh, came into this world. So the main aim of the 13th century hermits on Mount Carmel uh, was to reflect the spirit of Elijah, that is to follow the one true God. Through their life of prayer and fasting, they accomplished this. They were eremitics. You know, they were hermits. They led a very, led a very austere eremitical life. Elijah is an important prophet, not only as a spiritual leader and role model for Carmelites, but also for the entire salvation history for all mankind. Because the prophets foretold that the birth of the Messiah will be preceded by the return of Elijah. And Jesus confirms this when he says that John the, Bapt John the Baptist has come in the spirit of Elijah. That is, uh, you know, John the Baptist uh, you know, lived the prayer and the fasting and the austere life like Elijah. And he was a forerunner that was um, foretold in the Old Testament about Elijah. Jesus confirms that. And that is also going to be true with the second coming because the second coming of Christ and the first coming of Christ will have many similarities. So Prophet Elijah is not only loved and respected by Christians, but also by people of other faiths like Judaism and even Muslims and all Abrahamic faiths uh, have a love and respect for Prophet Elijah. And Elijah, as we said, is a forerunner of Christ. He's the one who will prepare the way also for Christ's second coming, as it was with the first coming in the person of John the Baptist who was also a man of prayer and fasting. Elijah was a man of prayer. He was a man of good works and he was faithful to God. He, you know, he performed many miracles during his ministry and uh, he even raised the dead. He was a man of obedience. When he heard God's voice, he carried them out promptly. He was not only a man of prayer and contemplation, but he was also a man of action. That's why the Carmelites imitate Prophet Elijah's charism of prayer, contemplation, and action. We see Elijah feeding the poor widow during famine. And of course, we know it is God who is providing, but through Elijah's intercession. And Elijah and Elisha even raised the dead back to life in the power of God, of course. And we see God's powerful protection in the life of Elijah as he is fed by the ravens in the you know when he's fleeing from his persecutors and he's also fed by an angel uh, when he's fleeing from his enemies Elijah he made many journeys in response to God's call and God himself provided and protected him uh, we see that those who speak God's words are usually persecuted severely but God himself will defend those who are faithful to him. This should offer us encouragement to all of us, you know, to live in hope that God will intervene in human history 
and that he will provide for us and um, you know with what we need when we need it god can override the laws of nature to to protect us you know to keep, to save us if we trust in god's providence and in his compassion god can change everything for our good god's providence always provides the essential nourishment both spiritual and temporal needs for those of us who trust him and who are faithful to him you know it's, it's, we have to be receptive to god's graces and uh, today uh, in this power and zeal of elijah the prophetic power and zeal of elijah we are called to conquer the injustices the poverty and all the issues in this world today through our service through our prayer and through our sacrifice we are called to remain strong in our faith and overcome spiritual weaknesses through our spiritual works and overcome social and economic injustices through our corporal works of mercy and service as we know in the uh, 1200s 1247 the hermits began slowly to migrate into europe and became less eremitic and more mendicant in their style of living so there was a big transformation but the devotion and inspiration to elijah the prophet remains with the order even today as carmelites today we face so many realities in this very complex technologically advanced world but we know in these realities sometimes these realities are contradictory they contradict our way of life sometimes but we know that god holds the destiny of each one of us and the destiny of the entire world and our history itself is in his hands and in his compassionate heart so god's love compassion and generosity cannot be outdone so we should unhesitatingly give ourselves to God and to the service of our fellow beings and God will provide for us as he provided for prophet Elijah, both our spiritual needs as well as our temporal needs. Also, there is a mystical interpretation of one of the events in the life of prophet Elijah uh, and connection with Mary, where Elijah is waiting for God to end the drought the seven years of drought in all the land and he sends a servant to look for rain clouds and three times he goes and the third time the servant comes back and says he does see the rain cloud he tells that he sees a small rain cloud in the shape of a hand a man's hand and the mystical interpretation of this white cloud which arises from the salty waters of the sea it represents the virgin mary carrying Christ who is the pure water, the rain water, the, and the sea below represents the sinful humanity, and the white cloud and the rain represent the sinless, immaculately conceived Blessed Virgin Mary and her son, Jesus Christ, who is the rain that ends the spiritual drought of God's chosen people. And Carmelite a prior general, Philippe Ribet of the 1491, he found many such connections in the scriptures between Mary and Elijah, and he documented that in his works. So Mary is not only our model, but she is also the patroness of the Carmelite order. Mary is the first and the most perfect disciple of Jesus because the merits of Jesus' sacrifice was applied to her at the moment of her con conception and the sacrifice of Jesus was applied to her in advance. So she became the first to taste redemption. And as she, uh, co she uh, conceived Jesus in her womb and carried him in her womb, she was in adoration and contemplation continuously. The scripture says that Mary pondered the words spoken to her we can picture Mary pondering what was happening to her, what was being said to her by the angel, by the prophet Simeon, by the prophet Isaiah during the presentation of Jesus in the temple, while the Magi visits 
the child Jesus and also all the visions of the angels singing, the dreams of Saint Joseph, all these events, Mary pondered on all these in her heart. That's why Mary is a model for contemplatives, especially for Carmelites who are called to ponder the law of the Lord day and night. Just like Mary, we are called to listen to the word of God, ponder God's words in our heart, reflect on what happens to us, reflect on all the daily happenings of our life and what, is, what does it mean, what is being said to us, what God is trying to communicate to us through those events and be able to discern the voice of God in the midst of our day-to-day -day realities. That's what Carmelites are called to do. As Carmelites, Mary is not only our model and our patroness, but she is also our mother, our sister, and we honor her as she is the most pure virgin. The hermits on Mount Carmel had a tremendous allegiance to the Blessed Virgin Mary and also on the insistence of St. Albert when they built the chapel where they celebrated daily mass, they dedicated that chapel on Mount Carmel in honor of the Blessed Virgin. And that's how the title Our Lady of Mount Carmel originated. They also called Mary as Our Lady of the Place. To this day, the Carmelite friars maintain the title Brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. And when the friars make their vows of profession, they are made not only to God, but also to Mary. Also as lay Carmelites, when we make our promise, our profession, we make them not only to God, but also to Mary. And since there is no known founder, other than through tradition, we, we believe uh, it's Elijah, but uh, because there is no historical known founder of the Carmelite order, we are named after the place, Mount Carmel, or rather, after Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And I'd like to just share this uh, from our formation material. A place can be understood in four ways. First, obviously, is geog geographical understanding. The second is juridical understanding. That is, it is a church-approved place. Mount Carmel is a church-approved place. And socio-religious, that means a place of prayer. And the fourth uh, is understood as a mystical place, a symbolic place of encounter with God. So Mount Carmel is both a church-approved place, a place of prayer, a mystical, symbolic place of encounter with God. And of course, also geographically, it's in Holy Land. So Mount Carmel is a very special place. It is a mystical place which every Carmelite should aspire to visit if they are able to. You know, centuries ago, people gave up their families, sold all they had, would risk their lives because it was very difficult to travel, dangerous to travel, travel in those days, to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So in these modern times when travel is made so easy, maybe we can at least try to do or try to make a pilgrimage, if possible, to go visit Mount Carmel in Holy Land. Also at the time of our reception into the Carmelite order, we are given the brown scapular. You know, this is a brown scapular. It's essentially made of two rectangular pieces of wool, woolen cloth. And it is supposed to be the garment of Our Lady. One has the inscription of Christ and the other has the inscription of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it's worn like an apron, you know, over the shoulder. And this is a symbolic and a sacramental um, reminder to Carmelites to put on Christ and to live out the virtues, the virtues of Christ's mother, you know, of the first and the most perfect disciple of Christ, his very own mother. The brown scapular is a habit of our Blessed Mother. It is the garment of our Blessed Mother. And Saint Pope John Paul II says 
that the scapula is a sign of the covenant between Mary and the faithful, that through her motherly intercession, she would provide for us her children who wear the brown scapula, continuous protection during life and at the hour of death, protection from the evil one. So protection so that we will reach paradise, we will reach heaven after our death. So we wear the brown scapula to remind us to live as good Christians and to enjoy the protection and motherly intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, our mother and the mother of Christ. So that would all be my uh, reflection for today. I hope you enjoyed watching this and I hope you have a blessed day.